that I love Monty Python. Why did we share that clip at the beginning of today's class? Yeah. Um, because there could be an issue with how you're weighing something. All right, so, so there could be calibration issues because she didn't appear to have the same mass as the duck. But she did weigh the same as the duck, so it was a fair test. She was a witch. Um, but, but why? So that wasn't actually my reason. But that's a valid, a valid guess. Why, why do you think I want to, besides the fact that I love Monty Python, and that my freshman year, C term my freshman year, so right about now, we watched this movie every day for seven weeks, and we had a copy of the script. And that may have been excessive, just saying. Okay, I think we're hung up on the flawed part of it because all measurements are flawed, right? Yeah. But but so they had some functional test ideas, right? They said, well, if if she's made out of wood, she'll burn. Therefore, she's a witch. So we could we could burn her, and we could tell if she's a witch. But that's that's sort of a functional test, right? Um, you could throw her in the pond and see if she floats. But again, it's a functional test. And and what they came up with was this comparative test, right? So they, they compared her with a standard, the standard being a duck because ducks float. And they were able to determine that, yes, she was in fact a witch. Yeah, I did. Did I? Yes, because my now, now the option is end broadcast. Perfect. Um, so it's this idea of this comparative test. And so yesterday, I want to say yesterday, but it was Tuesday, right? Tuesday, we talked about how the idea is quality is giving the customers what they need when they need it. And the customers ultimately are going to do a functional test on whatever we give them, right? Whether it's me with my toilet carrying it up three flights of stairs, or if it's Raytheon with the component that they need for the Patriot missile that they're going to go put in there. There's ultimately, when you launch that missile and it shoots down the other incoming missile, there's a functional test that's going to happen, right? So we would like to avoid the functional tests because they're expensive. Because And you only get to do that, that missile test once, right? Hopefully. You only get to do it once. I guess if it doesn't go off, maybe you can try to shoot it again. But, um, and so in our, in our quest to be better manufacturers, we'd rather do comparative studies instead of these functional studies to know if we made good parts. Does that make sense? So that's, that's why it's at the beginning. I think, well, either when I hit the space bar, it'll advance to the next slide or it'll play the video again. I don't know. Yep. It'll play the video. Oh no, it plays a different video. That's fine. I didn't want to watch this video, but close it. All right. There. Next one. All right, quality. <coughs> quality is giving your customers what they need when they need it. We said that last time. So we've all seen one of these, right? Has anybody ever zoomed in on it and really studied it? So we, we know that as... Manufacturers, we're going to do some some measurements, right? We're going to do some metrology. And and last Tuesday we talked about different things we could measure, right? So what are, what are the if we're doing CNC machining, if we're going to do CNC machining, what are the things we're likely to be measuring? Yes, we're going to measure length. Right, and our length could be in the form of a diameter, it could be in a width, a height, all these different things, but, but those are all length measurements. What else are we likely to measure as CNC? We might we measure mass or weight, but it's probably not gonna be one of the specifications on the design that our customer sends to us if we're a CNC machine shop. The designer may, 100% care about what the mass is, 
but they're going to have determined what the correct mass will be by giving you the volume that the part's going to take up. And volume is just length, right? So we might measure some material properties like hardness of the material, especially if part of our manufacturing process is intended to change the hardness of the material. So we might measure some material properties. More likely though, we're gonna demand an, a material certification before we receive the material. So we're gonna buy the material from a supplier that's gonna certify that this material is the material that we asked for. I suppose the people that, that make that material, they're manufacturers too, right? They're gonna to have to measure those material properties in order to certify that, well, they could just make it up, right? And that'll get you elected to Congress these days, just making stuff up. So, so we might be measuring material properties. What else are we gonna measure as manufacturers? So, so by length, we often mean size of stuff, right? And so when you said, when you said length, you were thinking of diameter, length, width, height, those things. And I think what you're talking about is location of the features. Yeah. And so, so our length could be size and it could be position. And so the location of different features on the part relative to each other tends to be important, especially when parts have to fit together. So we will be measuring length, size, or position. Anything else? Yeah. So we're probably going to measure finish. And so we'll say finish, we'll say roughness, we'll say texture, we say all these different words, and, and we're talking about basically the same thing and at the end of the, uh, of the lecture today. I think we're going to get into that in detail. Um, but let's get back to our $100 bill. So we could measure it, right? Right? And if we're doing our manufacturing we might have some quality inspection that we're going to do measuring length and size and position, material property, surface finish. There's two ways we could do this. We could do final inspection. So it's, and that's, this is, this is really sort of a, uh, a quality check. So we'll do this final inspection. And when we do this final inspection, what does it enable us to do? It enables us to not ship crap to the customer. Make sure you don't put crap in the box, right? Only put good parts in the box that go to the customer. And this enables us to get paid by the customer. So this is a good thing. We can also do quality control. And when we're doing this quality control, we're actually doing in-process measurements. We're measuring components before they're finished to make sure that when they are finished, we don't actually even need to do a final inspection because we didn't make any bad parts. Does that kind of make sense? If you, don't, if you know, 100% know, that your process cannot make any bad parts, do you have to do quality inspection? If it's physically impossible for your process to make bad parts, you don't have to do quality inspection because you don't make any bad parts. The reason for quality inspection is to not ship crap to the customer. That's the reason we do it. This quality control, if we're measuring parts in process, now how do we know that we're not gonna make a bad part? So let's say, let's say we're measuring diameter. Right? And so we've got our specification and it calls for a round part with a certain diameter. What, should the di what do you want the diameter to be? Three what? Miles? Three cats? 
three cats. I, so three millimeters. All right. Now, will we ever make a part that's three millimeters in diameter? Will we ever make one? Maybe. But what are we likely to make? Yep. So 2.999 maybe? Yeah. Or 3.001 maybe? You could you could add some zeros in there. Right? So we're likely to make a part. And so what is this? This is plus or minus 2. Is that true? It's plus or minus 1, right? It's a range of 2. It's plus or minus 1. Oh, this is, this is important. This is important manufacturing talk, especially machine shop talk. If I say I need that to be oh, millimeters, can we change this to inches really quick? We, we can get back to millimeters. But if we, if we say three inches and it needs to be plus or minus one, I mean it needs to be plus or minus one thousandth of an inch. I'm going to say one. Because I'm a, I'm a cranky old machinist, and I'm going to talk in cranky old machinist buzzwords and jargon. And so I'm going to say it's plus or minus one. If I say it needs to be plus or minus a tenth, I mean a tenth of a thousandth of an inch. Machinist talk. Oh, we didn't even get into cylinder or roundness. Yeah, didn't even get into that. But all we cared about was diameter. We didn't care care if it was a round diameter. Um, so here's the thing, though. Even if we can, oh, we could tell we could make this part. We could make this part in the lab at WPI all day long. Plus or minus one tenth. It would take some setup. It would, we would scrap some parts. But we could make that part all day long. But even if we made a part that was exactly three inches, we would never know. Because there's two sides to knowing what this diameter is, right? It's what diameter is it? What's the actual true value? And what does your measurement tool tell you it is? Right? So we've got competing things. We've got variability in our process that makes it so not all the parts are gonna be the same size. And we've got variability in our measurement process that makes it so we don't actually know what size anything is. All we can actually measure is the interaction of our measurement tool and the thing we're measuring. More expensive measurement tool, more zeros. Just adding more zeros doesn't necessarily give you more information. But we're engineers, right? We like to fix problems. So I've, I've outlined the problem, right? We actually don't know what size anything is and we don't know how to measure it. That's actually the problem. I was at a talk at the National Institute of Standards and Testing. There's a guy from Boeing giving a talk. We're talking about measurement uncertainty. So we're talking about this idea that we don't actually know what we measured. He, he noted that we have two competing problems. Designers put tolerances on everything that are too tight. Tolerances are too tight. They want it to be made too precisely. Well, especially like you're designing airplanes, you don't want them to fall out of the sky, right? So designers specify extra tight tolerances. Um, and we say we meet the tolerances, but we have no understanding of our measurement uncertainty of what's going on down here in these decimal places. So even if we thought we met the tolerance, maybe we didn't. So you can't fix just one of those problems. If you get really good at measuring, so you make it so your measurement uncertainty goes away, then you won't be able to afford to make an airplane because you won't be able to actually make those parts. And if you fix the tolerances without also fixing your measurement uncertainty, you'll, oh, we have these broad tolerances, but we don't actually know what we're measuring. Airplanes will fall out of the sky. Two competing problems. But as engineers, 
It says right here, in God we trust. Is that fair? Right. To, to, to trust in God, you have to have faith. Is that correct? As engineers, should we just have faith? I mean, we do it all the time. We call it uh, swag, right? A scientific wild-ass guess. Right? We, make, we make stuff up all the time. We have faith. But, uh, but when we're talking about quality and God we trust, everybody else bring data. Right? So if you zoom in, that's what it says. Everybody else bring data. And so what we want to do is we want to have a measurement plan that enables us to understand our manufacturing process so that we don't make any bad parts. Uh, and then we're probably going to have to do some QC at the end uh, or some, some, some quality checks at the end to make sure we don't ship any bad parts. Does that, does that sound fair? So if we're going to measure things like length and width and height and diameter and stuff like that, once we've... Should we measure every part? So manufacturing is rarely about making one of anything. I'm not going to say it's never about making one of anything. And uh, I did a design for manufacturability study on, on a product where they only made 12 units a year. Usually when you do design for manufacturability, you're trying to figure out how quick can you make the parts. Make it so it's really fast to make them because you're making thousands and thousands of parts. They were only making 12 a year, but each one cost $1.2 million. So you didn't want to screw up one of them either, right? So there's different things you can do. So should we measure every part? So let's, we go back to our three millimeters, right? Three millimeters. And we're gonna do plus or minus 0.001, plus or minus a micrometer. So should we measure every part? Let's let's do it. Let's measure every part. I think I got one more here. So once we measure the part, what should we do with the measurement? I guess it was that bad. Once we measure a part, what should we do with the measurement? Yes. Write it down. Okay. Um, so somebody make up a measurement for three. Four. What do you got? Oh, no, we have three millimeters. Three millimeters is our diameter. So let's measure a part. Plus or minus one micron. So... So, you know, let's make it 10. One's kind of small. Plus or minus 10 micrometers. All right, so I'm going to measure a part 3.008. I measured a part. What do I do? Is it a good part? It's a good part. What do I do? All right, so I wrote it down. Now what do I do? No, I made a part. I measured it. Now what do I do? Make the next part, right? All right, I make the next part. I measure it. 3.007. What do I do? Yeah. Make the next part. All right. 3.007. Oh, oh, again. Next part. 3.009. Oh, oh, Next part. 3.0087. Oh, oh, we'll add a digit. We, got, we, got, we just got a better set of calipers, right? 3.0091. Oh, oh, Keep going. Yep. All right. So you guys told me to write it down, right? And so we, we've built sort of a table of numbers for our measurements. I'm an engineer, though. 
I don't really want a table. Has, has anybody gotten value from a table of numbers in the past? What should we do? Let's make a graph. Yeah. Right. And so, so here's our here's our three. Right, three, how many, however many zeros you want, because that's exactly ideal. Um, I don't know. Oh, oh, oh. I don't know. What do we got? Oh, one, oh. Right, that's our, that's our tolerance. And so what we've seen here, I don't remember all the numbers in the exact order, but it looked something like this, right? Something like that was the numbers that we, we plotted. And, and so we might have been making, making a measurement every part. We might have been making a measurement every thousand parts. Right? So we might have been not making a measurement every part. We might have been sampling our data. So if, if you looked at this plot, what do you know? the diameter keeps getting bigger and bigger, right? You also see that there's some of this going on, right? There's some ups and downs in our getting bigger and bigger happening. What do you think contributes to the ups and downs? It could be some, it could be some operator to operator measurement inaccuracies it, it we don't know it's a thing we know we don't know anything. but we're going to infer that a lot of this sounds could be random variation of the stock material could be different lengths of stock material back in the days before we turn down that diameter will cause it to vibrate differently will cause it to come measure differently so there's going to be some part to part variation no matter what with every product but there's also going to be some measurement uncertainty with every measurement. So if you if you only see here's professor trick. I uh, I go out of my way to make it so that it's impossible for people to cheat on my tests and my exams by trying to make it so that nothing you would do would be cheating. It's impossible for you to cheat if there is no such thing as cheating. Um, and that's because it is so annoying when you find people cheating. Because you guys are not very good at it. <laughs> and if I find you cheating, I am obligated to report it to the dean's office. I, like, like, I could lose my job for finding you cheating and letting you get away with it. So I don't want that to happen. Uh, but some professors will they, they like to find the cheaters i don't i don't know what it is they it's their their personality and so they'll they'll design assignments where you have to hand in data that you've collected has, has anybody done a lab ex exercise where you had to hand in your data has anybody ever fudged the data yeah we all have if you put if your hand went down you lie about other stuff too right <laughs> and so Here's the thing, that professor has done that experiment a thousand times probably. And this, this randomness that you see in the, in the numbers, well, there's a normal variance that you're gonna see there. And when you fudge the data, you make the numbers really good, right? Yeah, and you always screw it up because there's an expected standard deviation in that data. And so you're always, but, most times they don't go hunt for it because like me, they don't want to catch you cheating either, but they totally know you made the data up. Um, so don't do that. Just if the data was bad, report the bad data and try to explain why it was bad. Um, but all right. So we can infer that there's some measurement uncertainty and there's some part to part variability. What can we infer about our process now? Yeah.
Yeah, so our mean is somewhere in here, right? So we get a mean value that's somewhere in there. Some of our parts are below the mean, some of them are above the mean. Um, it's, they're trending bigger over time, right? The more parts we make, the bigger the parts get. All right, so this I told you it's a turning operation, right? So what, what physically is happening in the machine? So you could, I think the solution is simpler than that. The cutting tool is wearing out. They wear out over time. As that tool wears out, our CNC program still tells it to go to the same spot, but it's not as long as it used to be as it wears out, right? So over time, and it's, it's really easy to do this example with a turning operation. Um, the other thing that happens though, <coughs> I used to own a machine tool that over a period of several hours of continuous operation, so things change with, uh, with temperature, right? And so metal tends to get bigger with temperature. As temperature increases, metal gets bigger. Well, those machine tools are made out of metal components. They change size with temperature also. And I used to have a machine that the spindle, um, so the Y-axis, would grow by a thousandth of an inch over about a seven-hour period. So we move a thousandth of an inch further away over about a seven hour period. And so it would change throughout the day. And then you turn it off at night and it would cool down. The next morning you turn it on and it would slowly change throughout the day. And so you get a cycle like that. So it could be more complicated than the turning tool wearing out. Um, but other things are happening in your process. So, but here, if we get a turned part, what are we gonna do to fix that? We could change the offset. We could just adjust the machine tool because when we do the setup of the machine tool, we tell it how long the tool is. We just tell it, hey, the tool got shorter. In fact, on the controllers for the Haas machines, there's a column for tool wear. As the tool wears out, you could go put in a number in that column and it just adds that to the other number and it shifts everything. And so we could make these parts all day long or maybe it's, maybe it's all week long. I guess that's a step function, right? When we adjust it, it goes back down. It'll go back up and right. And so we could we could continue that process. What eventually happens though? The so as that tool wears out, and we're gonna talk about this, I think we do it next week, might be the week after. I have to look at the schedule. Um so how sharp that tool is. And what the shape of that tip of that tool, because that, that shape changes as it wears out, right? So that impacts how much force it takes to make the chip. And as the force goes up, eventually tool breaks. We'd like to change the tool before it breaks, not after it breaks. It's always cheaper. But when would we like to change it? We'd like to change it just before it breaks. It's harder to do. All right, so, so we want to get some data. And so I've actually got some sample data here and we can look at, so, and this is the same, same idea, right? So in our graph here, um, in your, we'll do, a, we'll do a quiz, today's Thursday. We'll do a quiz that'll be out tomorrow and it'll be due next Wednesday. And one of the things we're gonna do in the quiz is talk about how to analyze this kind of data as it comes in and the things that you're going to do with it. Does that sound fair? We have to do, if it was up to me, everybody just get an A. And then my grading work is done. I don't have to do anything, but some of you like to know how well you performed, I suppose. I don't, I don't actually know that they would fire me if I just gave everybody an A. But I also don't want to find out like if I'm going to get fired, I want to get fired for something better than that. All right. Um, and so when you do your, your data stuff, we'll have you use um, some, either use Excel, Google Docs, one of these things to go through, do some analysis. We're going to have you find out some mean values, have you do some line fitting. 
and and also um, do some standard deviations to understand that. So the other thing we want to look at here. All right, so we got data. I don't want to do a lot of that. All right. So some of this comes down to to design. And so I put quality as the uh, as the first thing I talk about once we once we talk about what is manufacturing when I do this. To me, that makes sense. Um, but I also looked at this. I've looked at about a dozen different manufacturing engineering textbooks. And I could have made you buy any one of those dozen for part of the class, but I didn't because they're all expensive and you weren't going to really use it. Um, but I, but it, since, since I teach the class, the publishers just send me free copies all the time. Probably actually have enough to sort of populate most of the class by now, as long as we don't all have to use the same book. But I looked at all of them and, and I, I wanted to say, what, what do these authors say about quality of manufacturing? And what I found was that in every single instance, it was the last chapter of the book. And in every single instance, this is what they talked about. They talked about standard deviations in six sigma. So sigma is just the word we use to talk about a standard deviation. Do you guys know what a standard deviation is? Who's had a math class that had standard deviations? You, you, you nodded your head. So describe what's a standard deviation in data. <laughs> what's the standard deviation? Honest answer. Yeah. So, all right. So in, in, I don't, th there's a mathematical definition, right? Any math majors here? Good. So we can just talk about math then because we're all engineers, right? So we understand math and we're good at it. We don't have to do the mathematical definition. What I want to have in my head is the concept definition. And so you, you hit it right on the nose. It's the, it's the average distance of the points from the average value. If you think about it that way, it's, it's on, it, on average, how far away are all the points from the average value? And so, and so that's a number, right? We talk about one sigma, two sigma, three sigma, but there's one number that's, that's the average value of how far away the points are, and then multiples of that value. And so in this six sigma stuff, it, here's why I don't understand why it's in the quality chapter of the book. Although we use it as quality engineers, it's really a design thing. What they're talking about here is design parts that you can't make incorrectly. So if we never want to make a bad part, if, if, our, if, it's, if it's our three millimeter diameter and we never want to make a bad one, what's the easiest way to never make a bad part? Right. Make the tolerance so huge that you'd never make a bad part, right? So if I said it's three millimeters plus or minus two millimeters, and we're turning it on a CNC lathe, but you can see the difference, right? You don't have to measure the difference. You can see it visually. So you're never going to make any bad parts because, because your machine was much more capable of making the parts than your tolerance was. So if you want to never make bad parts, get bigger tolerances. Of course, the designers like to tighten up the tolerances to get better parts, which is a whole different thing. And sometimes they tighten them up too much. Yep. I feel like when we were talking about some uh, circle that was like three millimeters, I think what makes sense, I think the part that makes sense is the axis point. Yeah, so the, the point is, and, and we'll, we'll talk about this when we're talking about designing tolerances, the, the point is you have to have the tolerance that you require for the function. And, and so what they're talking about with this Six Sigma, but here's the deal. If you have a process, and if the tolerances are out here at plus or minus three Sigma, and you don't have that sloping up, right? That sloping up was not a normal distribution. If you have random variations in your part size only, and it's a Gaussian distribution, then 
of every part that's made with random distributions will be a good part. So you don't have to measure, you don't have to measure them. They'll be a good part because the tolerances are wide enough. As you tighten down those tolerances, you have a higher percentage of making bad parts. Does that make sense? So this is all they talk about in their quality section. What did I say quality was? Intuitively, we got it, right? How do you make better parts? Have wider tolerances and have machines that are more capable, right? So if you take the capability band and you make it really small, and you take the tolerance band, you make it really big, you can't make any bad parts. But what's quality in manufacturing? Yes. Right, it's getting the customer what they need when they need it. And, and so my, my um, idea on that was that none of these people that wrote any of these books had ever put a part in a box and shipped it to a customer. Uh, oh yeah, and we can use statistics to do anything we want to. Um, let's talk about some terminology. A lot of a lot of what we do in in in, um, in this is is making sure we're speaking the right words when we talk to people. Um, so accuracy versus precision. Accuracy is how close to the true value you are. Precision is how close to the, your other values are you. It, we've done this. Who's played darts? Right. And so you get there and you throw the darts and. And you get them all together, but they're not at the spot you were shooting for. And your buddies hand you a beer and say, hey, nice grouping. Right? It, it, same, same thing with um, shooting guns, right? It's, oh, nice grouping. Um, hopefully, if it's the gun thing, they're not handing you a beer afterwards, but who knows? <laughs> um, all right. So accuracy versus permission, about precision. Do you ever know what the true value is? How close can you get to the true value? So if you if you want to get as close to the true value as possible, what do you do? <clears throat> you could take infinitely more precise measurements using infinitely more expensive tools. Um, and that's that's typically the approach, the, the initial approach at most, so all, all the country, maybe not all the countries, many countries have a, a, a standards organization and a testing organization. In the U.S. is NIST, National Institute of Standards and Testing or Technology or something. I don't know. It's one of those acronyms. Um, and so they will calibrate specimens for you. And so what they've done is they're measuring length based on the speed light, the speed of light. Our, our, all of our lengths are traceable back to the speed of light now. And so they use a very precise instrument to tell you that this is three inches long, plus or minus maybe a few angstroms. And now they give it to you. Well, you pay them a lot of money, and then they give it to you. And now you take your ruler, and you measure it with your ruler, and you say, oh, I measure 3.1. Now you've calculated your ruler. You know that when your ruler says 3.1, it's really 3 to whatever, plus or minus some angstroms, right? Now you've calibrated your ruler. That's calibration. And so that's that. this is called a, interesting, it's an unopened box of gum. Makes me want to chew some gum right now. Um, this is a calibrated specimen or calibrated sample. And now that, now that measurement is traceable back to that measurement lab at NIST. So that's how we can compare and so we often take this to be the true value. But you got to remember that every calibration specimen comes with an uncertainty report. They're telling you it's this plus or minus something because that's the best that they can do with their measurement tool. Um, but uh, if it's cheap, right, if, if you need to do it on the cheap, how do you get closer to true value? Make a lot of measurements. Make a lot of measurements, find the average. Now, the average will still include any systematic problems, right? If it's calibrated wrong, you'll still be off by that. But if you take enough measurements, the average value, you can actually look at how the variance changes over, over the number of measurements, things like that. Um, all right, dimensional metrology. 
we're going to use tools to measure length, angle, flatness, roundness, diameter, form. Um, we're actually not going to use a coordinate measuring machine in M1800, but these are they're just, it's like a little ruby tip that goes around and it knows where it is in its own envelope and it touches the part, knows when it touched the part. Uh, these are the things that we're measuring. We know all that, right? Great. Five minutes for surface metrology. It's perfect timing because um, I could talk on this for days and days and days. It's so only having five minutes left means I won't talk on it for days and days and days. So what's a surface? So, I mean, surface me measurement was one of the critical things. I would say all manufacturing processes, the function of every manufacturing process, doesn't matter which one it is, if it's making a physical part, is to put a surface at a location. Every process is about putting surfaces at locations. The surface is a critical part of it. Uh, my definition of surface, I don't know if it's the right one, but I think it's like basically the layer you touch on. Like All right. I, I actually like where he's going. So he says the layer that you touch. I would I would actually generalize it a little bit more. It's the boundary between two things. And so often what we're looking at is the top of this desk. Well, when we're looking at it, it's the boundary between that desk material and the atmosphere above it, right? Yeah. When I do this, it's the boundary between my fingernails and the desk material, right? Everybody do this. You got, you've got a desk thing or a surface, right? You got two different, you got the wood and the desktop. Take your thumb and go back and forth across the desktop and then go back and forth across the wood that's right next to it. Oh, use your thumbnail, not, not the thumb, but the thumbnail. Which one's rougher? The desktop, right? Uh, you can actually feel the pattern of the texture based of the texture based on how fast you went across it, right? Right. So that thumb. Oh, so is that a good way to measure surface texture? Are you sure? Are you sure? So it turns out that if you practice and you calibrate your thumb. You can, you can measure about a ten thousandth of an inch variation between the surfaces. Like if there's a lip that's a ten thousandth tall, you can feel it. 100% every time. And if it's bigger or smaller, if you calibrate it and you practice, you can tell how big it is. And you can know that. Turns out that thumbnail test, that's the test that the Navy uses to check the welds on nuclear submarines. So it's good enough for the Navy for nuclear submarines. It's got to be good enough for us, right? But there's a lot of other ways that you could do this. I say thumb, but you could train any finger. I'm pretty sure if you're good at it, you could do it with your nose. It just would look weird, yeah. <laughs> right? But you need you need it. It, it you got it, you got a lot of nerves in your fingers, so you're very sensitive there. Um, having been punched in the nose, I know that there's a lot of nerves in the nose too. So I think it would work. Um, so I'm going to continue talking about surface measurement and metrology on Tuesday before we jump into whatever was scheduled on Tuesday, because I do want to get through some of this. Um, but I won't talk for days and days and days. Okay. But surfaces, the boundary between two things, the function of manufacturing is to put surfaces at locations and, uh, and then they have to do stuff.